All right, I think we are live and ready. Um, a very, very warm welcome to everybody joining us now. Uh, we're just going to take the next uh, minute or so just to wait for everybody before we officially kick off. Uh, my name is Amjad Iraqi. I am an editor here at 972 Magazine. I'm also joined by, by, joined by my other editors behind the scenes to help me with the technical support. Uh, I'll be introducing my guests uh, very shortly. Um, again, we'll give it just a bit of time for people to, uh, to hop on. Uh, it's been quite a day of many things and nothing at the same time, and I'm really glad to, that we're going to be having this conversation uh, live as that news is happening. Um, maybe just to kind of give a very quick um, uh, intro to who we are, just for those who might be a bit more unfamiliar. Uh, 972 Magazine is an independent uh, media outlet. It's made up of uh, several uh, Palestinian and Israeli uh, journalists, activists, writers. Uh, this is actually going to be our 10th year of, um, of our operations. Um, you can find our uh, site, obviously, at 972mag.com, uh, where we cover numerous issues about human rights, politics, society, uh, culture, uh, and everything else in between, uh, focusing on Israel-Palestine as well as across the Middle East, and also looking a lot at places like the United States and other related, uh, other related places. Um, if you go to our site, actually, which ties in very much with the topic that we have here, uh, you will see that actually in recent weeks and recent months, we've been producing a, a great deal of content about, uh, about annexation itself. Um, and we highly recommend that you dive into the website uh, to see some of those uh, analyses, articles, and reportings, some of which we've also shared on our Facebook and Twitter. I uh, would highly recommend that. Uh, I also want to draw people's attention to uh, the fact that we also have a 972 podcast, which both our guests, uh, Diana and Emily, have uh, both been featured on. Uh, both fascinating conversations. Also highly recommend uh, you check those out. Uh, Diana, we had a few months back uh, talking a lot about the deal of the century soon after it was uh, published. Uh, and uh, Emily uh, was actually, was also gives a conversation soon after Omar Shaker, the Human Rights Watch Israel Palestine director, uh, was uh, was officially deported and speaking about that legal case and the implications for wider human rights work. Uh, so it uh, definitely highlight those things. Uh, having plug that they've now uh, uh, been on the podcast. Let me introduce uh, my guests uh, before we go in deeper. Uh, Diana Butu, I'm sure many of you know, uh, she's a Palestinian human rights lawyer and a political analyst uh, who served as a legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team from 2000 to 2005, which is a very frequent commentator uh, that you can find uh, both on our site and many others. And we also have Emily Schaefer Oman, who is an Israeli human rights lawyer and litigator uh, who specializes in violations of international law committed especially by state and corporate actors in the occupied territories. And uh, also I uh, would like to mention the fact that uh, Emily was recently awarded uh, along with uh, uh, attorney Mohammed Khatib, uh, the Victor J. Goldberg Prize for their legal work. Uh, so congratulations to Emily for that as well. Um, just, uh, just a very quick sort of housekeeping rules for all our guests to know. Uh, you'll see that you have the options of engaging either in the chat box or the Q&A box. I'm sure many of you have been on these Zoom calls before, uh, uh, but please note, uh, please reserve the chat box for like technical issues if you have any problems with the audio or so on. Um, so please try to keep it to that. And if you have specific questions that you would like to pose to our guests uh, as we go further into the conversation, please try to reserve that to the Q&A. We'll be monitoring both, but it would uh, help us a lot if you, um, if you keep those uh, different toolboxes separate. Uh, and in terms of just a general format, uh, basically I want to give us a very, I'm going to give a very quick three minute introduction just to kind of get everyone on the same page of the latest news and the mapping or the state of play, what's, been, what's happened so far regarding um, uh, annexation, as we know. Um, I'll then uh, uh, engage in conversation with our two panelists for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, we'll go back and forth um, on, a, on a couple of topics about today and the general conversation. And then in the latter 30 minutes, we'll open it up to the full Q&As uh, to our audiences and I'll facilitate that. Um, and I think without further ado, I'll begin with sort of, uh, let's say the mapping out where we're at now. So I'm sure many people have been keeping track of the news to see if anything dramatic has uh, been announced or been declared. And so far it seems not the case. In fact, the latest that we've been hearing from uh, Israeli uh, spokespersons and from the Israeli government is essentially that uh, the prospect that they would actually initiate anything major in regards to annexation 
of uh, large parts of the West Bank w will probably not be happening. It's clearly not happening today, but may take a couple more days, a couple more weeks. No one is certain, but it's that this will actually be an ongoing process. Many people have been referring that they've been uh, in, in continued talks, uh, both inside Israel and abroad, to uh, essentially better coordinate uh, uh, these prospects. But essentially, that this is not really the dramatic date that uh, many people have been ma making it out to be. Now, I'll kind of leave more of that explanation to our panelists, but just to give a general impression for everyone, um, it's uh, I want to I want to kind of lay out the state of play on three different levels. So the first one is on the Israeli level. Uh, over the past few weeks and months, we've been seeing a lot of uh, demonstrations in places like Tel Aviv against the annexation move, which has been a very positive step. Uh, but on the but on the grand scale, really, the decision for annexation and the power for annexation is lies with the Israeli right wing. Uh, this is uh, centered first and foremost within the government, which itself is not actually united over how to move forward with annexation. There are disputes between uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Benny Gantz, his alternate prime minister, different members of the parties as well. Um, and those debates are less centered around whether or not annexation should go forward as it is about how to implement it or how it should be coordinated, how far do you go. So these disputes are playing a role in basically delaying uh, this process. Another aspect of this is, of course, uh, also uh, the Israeli settler uh, leaders and movement themselves, who are also having a lot of differences, both in terms of how the government is trying to approach annexation and also bringing in the prospect of the, of the deal of the century proposed by the Trump administration earlier this year, with many settler leaders say, worrying uh, or expressing their worry that uh, the deal of the century does not go far enough, that it actually legitimates a Palestinian state, or that uh, their own settlements may not be included in potential annexation. So these disputes are currently are, are basically a, a huge part of why this annexation process is still being stalled. The second level I want to bring up is the international reactions or non-reactions. Um, again, as we mentioned, the United States is basically one of the key uh, actors on this, and it's been quite evident over the past few years that the Trump administration has essentially um, enabled many of Israel's um, maximalist goals, including the U.S. Embassy move to Jerusalem, including the deal of the century now. Uh, but even there, you're seeing various disputes between different officials, even had Ambassador David Friedman uh, reportedly was uh, even trying to mediate between Netanyahu and Gantz about their differences uh, to no avail which is an interesting job for a foreign ambassador. Um, so there's that uh, actor. There's a European Union, which is also caught in many different disputes, even though they state that uh, annexation would be illegal, that it is in violation of international law, but there is, remains no consensus over how to move forward. Uh, some are pushing for things like uh, sanctions or some kind of more coercive punishments, and others are uh, demanding not to do anything. So this is uh, making the EU uh, very mobile for the, for the moment. Uh, and there are also Arab states, which have also been raising uh, their concerns and their alarms of annexation, also rather mixed. Jordan has so far been the most vocal on this, uh, but we've been seeing other Gulf countries essentially kind of warning Israel in a friendly way, for example, like the Emirates, uh, warning that this will have severe repercussions uh, regionally, uh, both in terms of stability and the prospects of normalization. And finally, the third level, and I'll uh, end on this point here, is uh, the Palestinian side. Uh, here you also have, um, uh, remind, uh, just to remind everybody, back in May, uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas uh, officially declared that he would uh, absolve the Palestinian Authority from its agreements with Israel, including uh, what's called security coordination between Palestinian security forces and the Israeli army. And it seems, uh, as far as we can tell, that there has been uh, quite a downgrading, but there's, it, there's, there's no real clarity of to what extent or the full, uh, the full depth of that. Uh, but we are seeing those consequences uh, uh, bit by bit. Uh, recently, I was actually, just before this webinar, I was on another webinar uh, where uh, Prime Minister Mohamed uh, al was also this, um, this was a webinar hosted by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, where he was also speaking about potential strategies for the Palestinians moving forward. And uh, at the moment, they're still going to be uh, essentially uh, continuing along the lines of, in his words, essentially continuing along the lines of the two-state solution, uh, essentially insisting that there is no partner for a two-state solution on the Israeli side and that, uh, that they would rather push instead of um, the failed bilateral negotiations, that they would like to move to multilateral negotiations. Uh, things that have been said before, but just to kind of put all these different levels in a nutshell, and I'm sure we'll go into this um, much further shortly. So with that very grand um, mapping out, I wanna now turn first to uh, Diana. 
Uh, Diana, I would love if you could take the next few minutes just to kind of sort of correct the context uh, that everyone, how everyone should be interpreting uh, this annexation move. Uh, as we've said, there's been a lot of drama, not only around this specific date itself, which has kind of been regarded as this deadline, but also on the concept of annexation. But for Palestinians who, you know, experience Israeli policies, you know, for, for decades and through various means, um, their understanding of the situation may not be the same as many uh, internationally are understanding it. So I think one of the first questions I want to ask is like, you know, whether annexation has moved forward now or in the future, would this uh, kind of uh, prospective move by the Israeli government actually be unprecedented? Uh, is this the first time that we're seeing such a move? Should we be putting understanding it in a wider, uh, in a wider stream of policies? Uh, how do you think we should be uh, understanding the context? Thank you, Amjad, for hosting me. Thank you for 972 Magazine for, for holding this and for hosting me. And thank you also to Emily, um, who's going to be my co-panelist. I'm, I'm very honored to be with you today. Um, is this unprecedented? Yes and no. I think it's important to put this in its, in its, in its proper context. The annexation has been going on um, de facto on the ground now for 53 years. And we've seen that in a number of ways. Everything from the establishment of Israeli settlements, the, the confiscation of Palestinian land, the um, putting up of uh, nearly 700 checkpoints and roadblocks in the West Bank. Um, there's now 600,000 plus Israeli settlers in the West Bank, making up about 25% of the population of the West Bank. And of course, these um, settlers have superior rights, are governed under a, different, uh, under a different law, they have the right to vote and so on. Um, so we've seen annexation take place now for 53 years. And what I mean by this is that if you look, there isn't like a special banking law that's in place for the banks that are in the settlements. It's the same banking law. There's a special commercial law that's in place for the, the businesses that are in the West Bank. It's the same Israeli law. The difference between that and now is the difference in approach. Now, there's, there's generally always been two um, approaches within the Israeli system as to how to deal with Palestinians. The first is uh, do whatever it is that you want, but do it under the radar. So build settlements, don't make a big fanfare about it. Um, put up checkpoints, but don't make a big fanfare about it. Build a wall, etc. All of these things has been have been generally the the mainstay of the way the main way that the Israeli establishment has uh, has operated. And then comes along Netanyahu, and Netanyahu has um, in his his vision is instead of doing this under the radar, let's be bold, let's be loud, let's be proud. And, uh, and so his approach has been exactly that. So we've seen, for example, in, the, in 2018 with the passage of the, the Jewish nation state law, that again, that wasn't something that needed to be passed. The, the system was already in place that it was already um, affording uh, Jewish privilege. They didn't need to pass a new law. The, 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 the Supreme Court was already ruling in favor of, um, of these laws, etc. They didn't need to have the law passed. But Netanyahu being Netanyahu said, no, we need to do, we need to be loud, we need to be proud, and we need to do it. And so it's that same approach that he's been taking vis-a-vis -vis annexation, that we have actually seen this taken shape now for 53 years in the West Bank. But the difference this time is that he wants to formalize it and he wants to formalize it and not face any consequence for it. So, so yes, it, it, it has been taking place, but it is a little bit different now because we're seeing a different um, face. We're seeing a, a, an Israeli government that is no longer ashamed. It's one that's no longer hiding behind the peace process. It doesn't care if the A word, apartheid, gets said any longer. Um, instead, it's, it's quite the opposite. It's embracing all of this. So that's where, that's where we are, Amjad. I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, that's great. And then and I love the focus, especially precisely about the approach. Um, I mean, as you said, uh, these policies of occupation have been going on for a very long time. And it's uh, in many ways, it's almost more about style than it is about 
uh, the, the actual objective. Uh, so this is uh, it's interesting, uh, 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 interesting framing to actually put it in that way. Um, now on this kind of um, looking at this sort of like broad tent uh, of annexation in this wider history, um, I want to turn now to, to Emily to kind of narrow in, let's say, on a particular case study. Let's say so. Let's take take a particular look at a, one piece of that tent. Um, recently, uh, some people may or may not know uh, there was uh, there's a, a law that was passed in uh, February 2017, if I'm not mistaken, called the Regularization Law. Uh, the very quick gist of it was that essentially that the law had sought to uh, legalize uh, what are regarded as outposts, uh, settlement outposts in the West Bank. I'll leave Emily to kind of explain it more. Uh, but uh, just a few weeks ago, the Israeli Supreme Court actually struck down the law after various petitions were put forward. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, Emily, who's kind of, who's dealt a lot into this kind of work, uh, and I think with this law as well, specifically, um, is uh, I'm wondering what you can tell us uh, based on your experience and based on what you've seen in terms of the story of this regularization law from its inception, uh, from the, to the Supreme Court cancellation, what are the sort of, uh, what's kind of like the diagnosis you, that you can make from this example of an annexation law? Uh, you know, what does it tell us about, uh, you know, how the Israeli legal system, political system operate? Um, what can we expect to be seeing um, in the coming months and years? Uh, what lessons can we take? Uh, and how do you see that uh, based on this particular study? Great, thanks, Amjad, and, and again, uh, thanks to 972 Magazine for hosting me, and, and again, what a pleasure it is to, to share this space with you, Diana. Um, I, I want to pick up on um, a few things that, that Diana said and, and, um, and sort of use them to put even the question of, of what we can learn from, from the regularization law example, um, and even from today, into context. So I think you know, it's safe to say, particularly as we were um, nearing today, July 1st, um, that for a lot of us, it started to become clear that today's outcome was was actually quite possible and maybe even the most likely one. Um, so I don't think that many of us are surprised um, by today's uh, events or, or non-events, um, but I think it's important to understand what might be going on here in order to figure out where we go from here. Um, so as I see it, there, there are essentially three broad categories of options for what could be going on here. One is that there really was never any intention by Netanyahu and possibly even by Trump um, to, to move annexation forward. This was, you know, as, as Diana said, a lot of fanfare um, and, and politicking, essentially playing to, um, to BB's base. Um, and, and in fact, in reality, this de facto creeping annexation is actually doing most of the work. Um, I, will, I will sort of, as a side note, um, flag here that while I do believe that de facto annexation um, is, is uh, sort of the name of the game and could very well be uh, the alternative to, to formal or de, de jure annexation, I, I do want to stress, um, and maybe we can come back to this if, if we want, that formal annexation, I believe, would actually open the doors for a lot more harm. Um, so we shouldn't underestimate what this threat is. Um, and, and within that same option that there was never any intention, we could also think that perhaps uh, Netanyahu was testing the waters um, domestically and internationally, and this was a perfect moment for that test, given, given the Trump administration and this window of opportunity. Um, and you know, to, to sort of gain information about how the, the annexationists, if you will, could move forward. Um, but this is also in testing the waters. Um, it could be, and sort of this is the second category, uh, that this is all part of a, a long game, a kind of piecemeal strategy. And in fact, piecemeal is what has always worked quite well, um, meaning that uh, sort of grandiose um, uh, and outrageous either law or policy is presented, um, efforts are made to advance it, and then, you know, just in the nick of time, a softer, watered-down version of that policy or law is what is advanced and, you know, presented, and then everyone goes, oh, we dodged a bullet, and this is something that we can swallow. Um, and so I think it's also an important thing to note so that we don't 
do that um, in this case so that we, we make mental note of that strategy and how it has, has you know, been, been sort of underpinning a lot of the, of the damaging policies um, over the past several decades. Um, you, you know, so this is this is how we have, in many ways, laws like the Nakba law, the boycott law, the um, Jewish nation state law, the NGO funding law, and I could I could go on. Um, and and so it's been in some ways in in, in Israel's favor to use this strategy, um, and it might even be the wisest strategy um, going forward. Um, the third category really is that. Um, that this is part of uh, uh, either a larger strategy or a failed attempt, but either way, that there certainly will be more attempts um, and of, of similar nature. So, you know, we know now that there is political will and intent. Um, there simply may not be the across the board support that is, that is needed. Um, and, you know, perhaps Netanyahu underestimated the opposition that he would face from within Israel, possibly from Europe, um, from the US, moving on to 2020, uh, potentially, or 2021, I mean, potentially. Um, but other factors might have, have also played a role. And one, of course, is, is the EU and the, the sort of broad announcements by EU countries um, about what responses they were planning or, or might uh, leverage. Uh, second one is the International Criminal Court. Um, and the expression of the Office of the Prosecutor that, um, you know, she would very much um, be motivated to investigate um, alleged crimes in, in Palestine um, by the prospect of, of annexation. Um, but in addition, we come to the regularization law and a question of whether that decision was actually uh, a factor. Um, so, you know, in the past, I have said that we, we should really focus on how uh, this, how the court rules in, in this case. If it rules on constitutional grounds, we're in trouble. If it rules on international law, on grounds of international law, we might have an avenue to pursue going forward. There might be a, a stopgap there. Um, and in the, in the end, the judgment is mainly based on international law. And, and um, again, with Israel's interpretation of, of international law, and there's a lot that we, could, that we could break apart and critique there, but still, in many ways, this judgment was one of the clearest on international law that the court has had in a very long time. Um, and I think it's very significant that it was decided eight to one. So just to briefly um, kind of touch on, on that point and, and um, to put it into context, which Diana did very well, you know, this was not the first time that Israel had, had legislated across the green line. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, a series of, of attempts um, in the past, whether it was on sort of more banal issues like higher education, poultry, um, and, and uh, criminal records and, and other kinds of, of categories, um, or even the fact that there is increasing judicial tolerance for blurring the lines between settlers and, and Palestinians, kind of treating them as having equal status as the local population um, as opposed to granting Palestinians that special uh, protection that they are guaranteed under, under international law. Um, so here the court suddenly drew red lines that it hasn't um, recently. And I very much think that we need to see this decision within the context of, of the looming threat of ICC investigation and potential prosecution, um, the, the court's judgment um, in many ways um, could be could be viewed as an attempt to show uh, the ICC that there is the rule of law um, in Israel and thus it doesn't have to intervene and that's that's very much part of the the way that jurisdiction in the ICC works. Um, there are still you know many problems at the ICC um, you know or many entry points for the ICC but um, I think the, the bottom line here is that um, this may also have have been a hurdle in the way of, of, uh, of actually pushing through um, annexation. And we'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see if what it does is actually maintain that red line or actually cause the state and, and military um, to look for workarounds uh, going forward. Thank you for that, Emily. And thank you also for, again, mapping out those institutions as well and the way that that's been playing out uh, and those sort of uh, um, 
at those different takeaways that you've been able to, uh, that you identified. Uh, and I, I'm going to come back to some of the points that you raised uh, a little later. Um, and before that, um, let's go back with uh, Diana. Um, uh, Emily has already mentioned, for example, some of these international institutions and international actors that have already been sort of uh, playing a role in Israeli calculations. Uh, also mentioned at the beginning about uh, different statements or activities that have been going on. Um, for a lot of Palestinians, especially, there's there's a high concern that there's basically this. For the most part, there's a lot of international immobility. Uh, there are activities uh, per se, but in insofar as uh, kind of hard actions, uh, many Palestinians are worried that this will not actually transpire and hence allow Israel to move forward with that. Um, given this um, kind of international context, uh, which again uh, has been going on for, for quite a while, I'm curious how you've been seeing, you know, what have you been seeing on the Palestinian side of things from the leadership level uh, down to civil society, down to the grassroots, um, how they've been uh, try trying to kind of uh, rework uh, their own uh, political activity and their own uh, forms of resistance in the face of annexation. Uh, how has the PA been responding to this? We mentioned the uh, President Abbas and the Prime Minister Shtayib uh, earlier, uh, but how is that going to go forward? Uh, what kind of role can Palestinian grassroots organizations and movements play in, how, in interpreting this and taking action forward? Um, how are you seeing uh, the people who are most going to be affected by this, including Palestinian communities in these areas of the West Bank uh, that may uh, that will face the brunt of annexation? Um, it's a rather large question, but I'm curious, like how, how is the community essentially trying to mobilize um, against this way? Uh, thank you, Amjad. Uh, I usually get asked the question only about the international community and rarely about, um, uh, about Palestinians. So this is, this is refreshing for me. Um, first, I'll talk about what the, what the PA has done and then um, not done. And then I'll talk about uh, civil society and, uh, and take it from there. So in terms of what the PA has done, the PA has taken a, um, a kind of a two-pronged strategy. The first pronged strategy is to say that, that not only are the Oslo Accords dead, that they've resolved themselves, but they've also indicated that the that it's dead on uh, in terms of all of the obligations that they face with that they have under the under the um, under the Oslo Agreement. So, what that's meant is that they're they're no longer, or they claim that they're no longer engaging in any forms of collaboration, cooperation with the Israeli government, um, with the army, and and this is unlike in the past where we've seen. I think I was counting it something like 19 times that this um, statement had been made in the past. This time it looks as though it's sticking. I don't know how long it will stick, but it looks as though it's sticking. The reason I'm not so sure how long it's going to stick is because, as, as you know, Amshad, and you know, Emily, um, and I'm sure others know as well, everything, virtually everything has been transformed into security collaboration. So in order, for example, to, um, to, the, to be able to get a business permit, you have to go through the security route. In order to, for some cases, to, to get health care, there's a, there's a security component. For example, there isn't a single hospital in the West Bank that is allowed to uh, bring in radiation um, therapy equipment because it, it, it violates Israel's quote unquote security rules. So therefore, a person gets caught up in the security side of things, even when it comes to getting health care um, and, and so on. So the level of which the level to which the Palestinian Authority was serving as Israel's security subcontractor was not just on the side of arrests and um, putting people in prison, but it was also going down to the to the micro of being able to get permits of of uh, being able to import things and so on. And so th on that part, I'm not so sure how long this break in security cooperation collaboration is going to last because the consequences for the Palestinian Authority can be quite dire. And the consequences for the people, uh, for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza is all, can also be quite dire. And so I'm not sure um, how long that end of things is going to last. So that's been the, been the first prong approach. The second prong approach that they've taken is to say that 
if so there if um, annexation is to go ahead then we're going to see what they call the manifestation of a state on the ground i'm not entirely sure what that means i'm not so sure that they have really um uh, I'm not sure that I, I've heard, heard anything really articulated in terms of what it means either. But what I have seen is that for the first time ever, that the Palestinian Authority is asking for um, Israel to be held accountable through sanctions. This is something that we didn't hear in, in the past. Now, a lot of this, by the way, is a little bit too little too late. Um, that they should have had a system in place, you know, 20, what, 20, three years ago, 20, whatever, however, more than two decades ago, in which they thought through an alternative strategy because the writing was on the wall. If you didn't see it in 99, by 2002, it was, it was totally apparent that there was never going to be freedom for Palestinians. Um, and so they should have had an alternative strategy and they unfortunately didn't. That's on the side of the PA. On the grassroots side, that's where things are a little bit um, more, in, in many cases, much more interesting. The reason that I think we're, we're talking about annexation so much, and the reason that we see that, that there's so much media attention about it, and that um, the world is talking about holding Israel accountable, if anything, is because of the work of 15 years, we're almost at the 15-year mark, of the BDS movement and other movements where they're pushing to hold Israel accountable. And so as I was mentioning at the beginning, there really is no um, substantial, like, I, I agree with you, Emily, the, if formal annexation takes place, the, the consequences will be dire. I do think that it will lead to the to settlers being able to do whatever it is that they want to do. I do think that the army's going to confiscate more land. I, do, I, I agree with all of that. At this moment in time, I think that the only reason that we're seeing so much emphasis on annexation is because of the work of civil society and the grassroots movement who've made it clear that we have to start focusing on this issue. And they've very much been framing it in, through, in the context of this is now apartheid that has become formalized and, uh, and that if there's one thing that the world has held sacred, it's that the, the sacred cow of the peace process and the even more sacred cow of the two-state solution. And because of the work of, of the grassroots movement, we've seen that those that we've put, you know, there's been a hole that's been poked in the, in the, these two sacred um, cows. Where I think we should go is, is also beyond this. It's interesting now that people within the PA are talking about two different elements. One element is talking about disbanding the PA, a conversation that was not being had with any seriousness um, even three years ago. And another conversation that's being had about um, pushing for this to be an anti-apartheid struggle. And so the, the movements that we're seeing, the, the, the space is opening up for, the, uh, for, these taboos to finally, to, for these taboos to finally be broken and addressed. Thank you for that, Deanna. And thank you for also laying out exactly like the extent of the agency and that sort of long-term work that has been done by Palestinians and by allies and solidarity activists to help get us to this point where, like you said, the conversation uh, really is changing, uh, that the politics may still be dire, but there is this uh, progression, um, even in just the environment in which we're able to uh, speak about these things. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and now finally, uh, before I turn over the q and I want to turn actually back to Emily. I want to come back, uh, continuing on the line of what Diana was speaking about regarding this sort of, um, you know, the, this, this growing movement over the past few years, especially from the grassroots, from civil society, this work that's really being done by these people and by these groups. Um, I'm curious as well as your take as one of, as a human rights lawyer who's, who has been in this, uh, you know, in this field, in civil society, working with the grassroots and communities. Um, I'm curious, um, and touching on some of the things that you mentioned in your earlier remarks, uh, having analyzed this sort of legal political situation and seeing where you are as an activist, as a human rights lawyer, what have been sort of like, what kind of takeaways or what, what do you see as being the ways forward uh, for uh, lawyers like yourselves, for activists on the ground? How should we be thinking about using law and politics and activism in the future? Um, you know, where do we see us uh, going, uh, going in the future with Israeli civil society, international as well, and also lessons that Palestinians can take and how all those tie in together? Sure. I, I'm really glad that we're having this discussion because I, I think that you're, you're really 
uh, homing in on, on something that, that I know for myself is, is something that I'm struggling with um, in terms of, of, you know, what are the best strategies, but also particularly in the framework that Diana just laid out um, very, very well, the, a lot of the strategies, particularly the legal strategies that we have, do not allow us to break down uh, the, the two state paradigm uh, or, or, you know, the, the fact that, you know, Oslo is over and, and, uh, and we have to look for a new paradigm. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a few different strategies, but I, but I want to have that sort of a disclaimer or in the background as we think through them, because I, because um, that is, a, that is a, a problematic um, piece that, that um, we, I think, need to be thinking about um, and that I certainly will be doing a lot of thinking about um, in the coming, you know, weeks and months. Um, so, you know, certainly there, there are some promising um, revitalization, if you will, of, uh, of, of grassroots movements, of, of um, even, even though small, of, of Israeli public opinion coming out and, and standing against this. We even in the past um, week or so have had, you know, um, former, um, you know, IDF uh, generals and and uh, and legal um, advisors say this is not the right move, um, and and those are positive developments. I think that that this is an opportunity right now. We sort of we bought time with uh, with with July first not being a magical day for for annexation, and instead of as I said before, kind of you know. Leaning back uh, uh, on our laurels and and celebrating the the dodged bullet, we should be exactly right now mobilizing and thinking about what do we do because um, in some form or another uh, the threat still exists and I think that the threat is even more um, insidious and and dangerous if uh, if it is indeed going to go through that sort of piecemeal or incremental uh, method that I mentioned before. So, you know, all of that is a caveat to, to the fact that um, as I see it, you know, we, we kind of have, um, we have the Israeli legal system definitely keeps us within a very strict paradigm. Um, and there is a very, very um, long ongoing and I think interesting conversation about whether or not to even use the Israeli legal system. Um, I think that for most of my colleagues and myself, um, as you know, sort of cause lawyers who are thinking broader, more strategically, and not just about uh, individual cases, the kind of conclusion that we've come to is that we want to very, very selectively um, use the, the Israeli legal system when we believe that um, the there are minimum minimal number of risks um, and and a lot to be gained. So I think that with in the example of the regularization law, you know, that was very overt. Um, I think that it, it could not have just been, you know, unchallenged. It could not have gone unchallenged. And, and luckily, it didn't end up creating bad precedent that makes things worse, at least for now. Um, I still do believe that, that it um, could have the same effect that, for instance, the Alon Moray case in the late 70s, the, the Duikat case had, which was to simply motivate the various political um, and, and military echelons to find a new method to create settlements and to confiscate more land in the West Bank. Um, so all of these factors need to be taken in consideration before running to, to the Israeli legal system, particularly given that there are major efforts in, in play right now to limit um, the, the power and jurisdiction um, of the Supreme Court to reroute land related cases to district courts, um, which I think in many ways can be seen as a form of annexation because those courts are supposed to deal with the regions that they're located in. So uh, moving West Bank land related cases to, you know, the Je Jerusalem district court suggests that um, the West Bank is, a, is an attachment, you know, an annex to, um, to, to Israel. Um, so, so all of that said, um, those are those are really important considerations. There's also, of course, the the EU and opportunities, um, le both legally and and uh, and in a maybe grassroots and diplomatic sense. Um, so I think that it would be wise for for us um, when we think on on in terms of grassroots strategies to think about how we can partner and create you know cross border 
um, strategies together um, that will try to capitalize on the potential that the EU has um, to step in here. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that the EU is Israel's largest trading partner. Um, and, and it has a lot of power that it could wield um, and in a lot of ways needs to be kind of, you know, coaxed um, and, and encouraged to do that. Um, so, so, you know, we have so-called differentiation in place that very much uh, continues along the same old lines um, and, and doesn't bring the conversation to, to the next step. Um, you know, so it's, it's differentiating between Israel proper and, and, uh, and the settlements and, and, uh, and territory beyond the green line. Um, but it hasn't so far had much teeth. So for instance, there's an opportunity perhaps to say that what needs to be done is not just label products or um, delineate treaties, um, but rather to ban uh, certain products that, that are settlement products, to, um, to forbid um, certain relationships, um, and in other words, treat um, the settlements as a, with non-recognition, with actual non-recognition. Um, of course, there's the ICC, which you know we, we've now mentioned a couple of times. Um, it, I think, although I'm I'm the first to say not to put all of our eggs in the ICC basket, and we don't even know if if you know an investigation will will move forward, and it's highly contested um, and and questionable what um, what impact a decision there could have. I still do believe that um, the the threat. Um, is, is of, of ICC prosecution is a major deterrent um, for Israelis and for Israeli officials. Um, we've seen it in the in the Khan al-Ahma case, uh, where even Israel's Supreme Court sanctioned, um, in other words, uh, approved the demolition of the entire village of, of uh, 200, more than 200 residents. Um, and that happened two years ago almost. We haven't seen a single family um, be evicted. And in large part, uh, that is because several weeks before the scheduled uh, demolition, the ICC prosecutor announced that if it were to go forward, it would constitute a war crime. Um, so you do see where there, there is a deterrent, um, where there's potential for, for deterrence and a deterrent impact uh, by the ICC. And just a last category that I want to really quickly, I know we need to move on, um, flag is, is um, an area that sort of draws both on the EU and ICC's influences um, and, and might seem less intuitive, but um, that is the area of corporate accountability. Um, and that is because there are so many uh, major corporate actors and international corporate actors as, alongside Israeli corporate actors that are uh, not only you know, profiting from, um, but also in many ways propping up the, um, the settlement industry, um, other policies and practices um, in, the, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem in particular, um, but also um, that are in fact, um, that are complicit in and encouraging these industries to, to continue to exist. Um, and a lot of those companies are in fact uh, domiciled or registered or otherwise sufficiently linked to the EU and, EU's, and EU countries, um, where the law is in fact uh, quite strong in most of those countries um, regarding the responsibilities of companies to follow international law and even their own domestic law. Um, so in this sense, um, and particularly with annexation now, um, all of the you know, crimes and international law violations that are on the ground already um, get this added layer of, of egregiousness and of criminality. Um, you know, annexation in and of itself is, is actually uh, a crime, uh, the crime of, of aggression. And when it is superimposed on, uh, on these activities, it makes them actually graver. So we, are, we have not so far seen enforcement of these laws on, on corporations, but we are in a, a moment of incredible um, growth and advancement of, of the whole field of business and, and human rights. Um, and so I believe that this pro provides us with a really important opportunity 
to actually uh, hold these companies accountable, um, to deter other companies from continuing to advance these, these, uh, these violations, uh, and to have a real influence on what Israel does on the ground. I'll stop there. Thanks. That was excellent laying out of all these avenues. It's, uh, thank you very much for that. You also, uh, both of you managed to also answer a couple of questions even before they were asked. So now, <laughs> well, well, we'll find some other ones to go with. Um, I want to come back a little bit to some of the things that Emily uh, was just talking about regarding the EU and legal stuff uh, in just a moment. Sorry, I should rephrase that. Uh, but before I kind of, but, uh, but before I get to that, actually, in, in a second, I want to turn it back. Um, there's, there's been a question um, uh, that I think I'll post to Diana. It's um, it, it was raised about the, what are the what exactly? Or let me let's say it like this: uh, How is annexation playing a role regarding Palestinian political reconciliation? Uh, we, sp we spoke about what the, P what the PA or PLO is doing and spoke about the grassroots. Um, and uh, I'm curious, like within the political leadership itself as well, like uh, beyond uh, Fatah or, or the Palestinian Authority, uh, are we seeing any shifts about um, how, how the Palestinian leadership and different factions are coordinating around annexation? Is it still very much in the same uh, kind of uh, separation, the same divisions? Um, are we seeing any movement on that front? Will that likely remain uh, a continuing, uh, continuing element. Um, sadly, um, Shad, I don't think that we've seen any real coming together. The, the things that we have seen is that there's been a convergence. That, uh, all of the political parties are against, and they and they've all expressed that they are against um, West Bank, Gaza, um, all of the various political factions. The problem is is that they haven't transformed that into anything bigger, into a, a, a larger political movement, or into um, a way of getting past the differences that exist uh, on the level of the Palestinian Authority. But that said, there is now a little bit of movement. Um, when you have the Palestinian Authority that's now saying that, that it's not going to abide by Oslo, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel itself bound by Oslo any longer, that it's also saying that it's, it's no longer engaging in security cooperation, collaboration, however it is that you see it. Um, it's one step closer to having some type of unity. Unfortunately, however, I think that the disunity has been quite entrenched and has become personal. And, um, and so unless it gets, it gets dislodged in some way and, and gets turn, transformed into something that's not personal any longer, then I think we're just going to continue to see very much of the same. It, this is the, the tragedy of all of this is that on, I don't want to say on all the issues, but on many issues, there is, um, there is a great deal of agreement. No, no Palestinian wants to see Gaza bomb. No Palestinian wants to see Gaza closed off. No Palestinian wants to see settlements. No Palestinian wants to see the wall. No Palestinian wants, wants to see annexation. Like, you name it, it's all there, but it's a question of how that comes together in, in terms of a strategy. And that's the part that um, sadly has been lacking, mostly because there's been a focus on power structures and who controls them. That's a very uh, that's a very sobering point um, on those issues. Um, another question we've been getting, and I think uh, both of you can respond to this uh, perhaps in different ways. Um, uh, uh, we, wanted, we wanted to dig a little deeper into the European Union. Uh, Emily was mentioning, for example, the extent to which it is a major kind of uh, political and economic uh, um, a broker, basically, uh, both in the Middle East peace process in general, uh, as a trader with, uh, uh, with Israel and as, as a bit major fund of the Palestinian Authority. Um, there's a point was raised by one point was raised, excuse me, by one of our audience members that, you know, despite the fact that the European Union has opposed all, all these moves, uh, in many respects, the EU sort of de facto, it, at least in practice, accepted, for example, Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem. Uh, which was captured in 1967 and then officially annexed under Israeli law in 1980. Uh, there's also the same with the Golan Heights. Uh, even with the uh, when uh, President Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem, there wasn't really a real uh, a consequence for something that they said was uh, completely against their uh, their policies. Yet, um, you know, yet there wasn't a real real bite to it. And again, as we were talking, like around this date, whereby the European Union was warning against this initial date, and there's now concern that because nothing has happened today. 
that the international actors will sort of slow down or calm down and not be as aggressive in their opposition to these policies. Um, so I'm curious, both your takes, like, you know, how can, you know, given the sort of these circumstances, um, how can people uh, push the EU uh, further on this? Uh, Emily, you were mentioning, for example, policies of differentiation about other legal avenues. I'm wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit more on that. Uh, and then maybe, Diana, if you have anything also to add, either on the legal and the political level um, of where things can keep moving for the EU or what the European, uh, European actors should be, uh, should be taking into account a little further. You want me to jump in? Great. Um, yes, I mean, of, of course, this is a, an excellent point about, about the European Union. Um, and as I mentioned before, e even its differenti differentiation policy um, has, has not, unfortunately, um, borne the kind of, kind of response or um, really had the, the teeth or enforcement that we, that we would have uh, hoped for. I think, you know, first of all, with the EU, there, there are a lot of issues. The EU is dealing with a lot of its own uh, issues and, and problems right now. And that's, that's, that was even before we had the coronavirus um, to, to deal with on top of it. Um, there's also a little bit of a lack of consensus or, or uniform policy across um, EU countries. And that, that certainly stalls um, and, and waters down, perhaps, a lot of the potential. Um, and I, I think another um, major issue is that the EU has focused almost to the exclusion of other, um, of other uh, methods on advancing the two-state solution um, and sort of has, in a way, abandoned um, other, other policies um, or potential avenues in order to uh, focus on this particular paradigm. Um, that said, and especially with coronavirus in the background, the, the various statements and, and, um, and threats, if you will, uh, from, from the EU itself and from, from EU member states, including Germany, including the UK, um, over, over recent weeks and months um, has, has been promising. And I don't want to overstate or, or um, overestimate what, what could uh, result from it, um, but it, it did signal uh, that there might be more, um, that annexation might be more of a red line um, for, for EU states. Um, and the other thing is that I, you know, will sort of reiterate what I said before. I think that there are ways, um, both through legal means and through, um, you know, civil society um, um, interaction and engagement to, um, to push the EU to get, a, to get a little bit out of the two-state solution paradigm um, and to start advancing some of the other tools that it has in, it, in its toolkit. I know a lot of that work is being done um, behind the scenes and um, perhaps with, with uh, the threat of annexation, um, more will join in those efforts and, and they'll become more, um, you know, more clear and, and have more results. Great, do you, have, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add uh, just a couple, some you know, numbers and things on um, putting it in, putting this in its in its in in some some light. I don't know if it's proper light, but in some light. If you if you look at the past, I think it's five years. Um, we've seen that Israel has demolished some five hundred EU funded structures worth, I believe, it's one point seven million euros that um, we see, for example, that as Emily mentioned earlier, that uh, although there's been a ruling by the EU's top court regarding labeling of settlement goods, that these goods are still being labeled as products of Israel. Um, and we also see that when it comes to other issues that the EU has been able to come up with, with sanctions and with, um, with putting pressure on these countries. For example, there's 30 plus countries and about 1,200 individuals and 500 entities that are currently facing some type of sanctions by, by the EU. And you contrast that with the way that Israel's been treated where it's the exact opposite. There is no talk of this, even though it's impacting not only Palestinians, but also the um, EU money itself. 
and so the the so I'm very pleased that we are starting to have this conversation, or that Europe is starting to have this conversation about um, accountability. And I recognize that it's not going to happen overnight for all of the reasons that I just mentioned. But with, there is a system that is in place that can push it there. And that for me is the important part, is that that taboo has been broken and we just have to keep pushing it forward. So for people who say that you know, you can't, they can't impose visas on um, settlers, they can't, visa restrictions on settlers, they can, they did it when it came to Crimea. Um, for those who say they can't put, they can't impose sanctions on Israel, they can, they've done it for 30 other countries. For those who say they can't block um, settlement goods, they can. They, they can do all of these things. It's just a question of political will. And the fact that we are now, we, we're now having this conversation means that we're, you know, we're at step, you know, maybe one of many, many, many steps. But that step is very important. And once we have that conversation on annexation, it opens up the door to have the conversation about everything that Israel's doing. And that's why I think there's so many people who are opposed to it. And not just, uh, there's pe people who would normally, who are the, the settlement supporters who are opposed to it, because now they're saying, look, you brought, the, you brought the spotlight on us. We were doing this very quietly, and now, now the spotlight has, has come on to us. Great. Uh, let's actually jump now across across the pond to the United States. Uh, another very common question with annexation. Um, again, we're quite familiar with uh, how the Trump administration has been going forward with this. Um, we mentioned some of this. I think also, Diana, you talked about this a little earlier regarding some of that, some of the grassroots changes that have been going on over the past 10, 15, 20 years that has really helped to kind of uh, really alter the ground in American politics. And um, over the past uh, few weeks, even I think just yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, the news was coming out about uh, a letter being signed, uh, signed excuse me, by several uh, uh, Congress people, I think led by uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, also co-signed by Bernie Sanders and several others like progressive uh, representatives, which again is a sign of uh, things that have been happening uh, even in the centers of American power, which weren't the case um, a while ago. Uh, we've, had a couple, we've had some questions here exactly um, in terms of how we should tie in or try to um, uh, think about these new movements in American politics in regards to annexation. Like, it, how optimistic can we be? Uh, and I remember, Deanna, we also talked about this on, our, uh, on the podcast a few months back. Uh, you know, how optimistic can we be uh, in terms of these these changes that are happening within the Democratic Party, uh, if, for example, um, a lot of people have been asking if Joe Biden does become uh, uh, president in November, um, you know, how significant uh, can those changes be, or what avenues uh, can be can be taken by civil society and the grassroots to push uh, that political spectrum even further? Um, how are you how are you both analyzing uh, the, how these shifts are happening and the prospects for that? Um, and what can, what can Palestinians especially expect from the United States on any level, uh, given, you know, given its role in the current status quo, the quote unquote status quo, uh, and the wider structures of the peace process and going forward? Um, either one of you, you're welcome to jump in. Uh, Emily, I see you uh, uh, getting ready to, <laughs> you're welcome to. Sure, we can, uh, um, don't all answer at once, right? Um, I think there's just so much to say on this. So, you know, kind of uh, um, um, drawing my, my thoughts as we, as we go. Um, there, I, I personally see and have seen over um, the past couple of years really now, a lot of positive developments, even just at the discourse level. Um, in, in the United States. Um, it's in part because of, of you know, certain brave uh, politicians, um, and it's also because of major um, organization um, and, and mass movement on the ground um, in the U.S., which I, I think is, is inspiring uh, and, and should really be um, something to think about, you know, how much of that could be um, mapped onto to struggles in, in Israel and in Palestine. Um, I think that we have a long way to go. Um, and in many ways, annexation has been, has been a red herring, right? It, it's, uh, it's taken our focus off of 
what we what, you know we've been talking about even here tonight about uh, the the paradigm shift about calling um, apartheid apartheid um, you know about thinking about a, a viable way forward um, but at the same time to the extent that it is something to to mobilize around that is something that is that is concrete that um, that can can be as I've said before a, a red line I think it is useful um, and what I would say is is important um, in the US context is you know taking off my lawyer hat for a second is less um, hammering home the point that that annexation is a crime that it's an act of war um, you know that it, that it would completely um, um, you know devastate um, an already um, uh, a situation that's already in many ways on life support um, for Palestinians in the occupied territory but um, but also, but, but instead, right, um, to, to use it as a springboard um, for talking about what is actually happening on the ground. Um, and so to the extent that we here can kind of feed that conversation with really good information and really good facts, um, I, think that that, I think that that's our role. Um, and again, I don't want to put eggs in any one basket, so I'm not putting them all in, in the U.S. basket. But um, it certainly is a um, is a is a force or a, a a lever that should not be overlooked just because of who is sitting in the White House and who may or may not be sitting in the White House moving forward. Because regardless of who it is, we will still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, very well said, uh, Diana. Any thoughts as, on this as well? I'll just quickly add. You know, one of the things that that the that APAC used to brag about was that there was no daylight between Israel and the United States, whether the party is the Democratic Party or the, or the Republican. And now we are beginning to see that there is some daylight. And I, I don't want to overestimate it because I know that um, Biden is going to, to just, if elected, he will take us back to the place that we were before, which is pushing for a peace process. Uh, he's not going to undo the, the, the embassy and so on. But again, the fact that there is, that, the, that this is no longer the sacred cow of no daylight, but there is this space to be able to criticize Israel. It's taken a very long time, but we're there. You know, I want to I just very quickly mention, I was going through some um, archives of some, uh, some newspapers way, from way back in 1967. And immediately after the, the Israel occupied uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, there was an editorial, I can't remember if it's the New York Times or the Washington Post, but one of them, that praised the occupation and called it a new model for the Middle East. Now here we are 53 years later, it's taken 53 years, um, and that, but you would never see that any longer. You would never see that is, this is the new model for, for the Middle East. So, um, so we, there, are, there are changes that are happening. It's taking far too long, but those changes are, are definitely happening and we have to pick up and run with them. Interesting. Interesting also that was a perspective all those years ago as well. A little terrifying. Um, uh, if it's all right with both of you, uh, we're hoping, uh, we'd like to ask maybe two or three more questions for another 10 minutes or so, if that's uh, good. We've got a lot of uh, questions and participants and uh, also, also ranted quite a bit on the intro, so I wanna make sure there's a good space for, for everyone to get involved. Um, I wanna hop again over the pond and back to Israel. Um, so, you know, we've spoken now about like, also, like how, these, how American politics is having its shifts, incremental and in different areas, but we are seeing those shifts. Um, uh, a question that's being raised is, is kind of centering um, how the Israeli political spectrum currently is at this moment. Uh, I was mentioning at the beginning, you know, these kind of uh, disputes that are happening um, within the Israeli right. Uh, we've been saying for many years that Israeli politics as a whole and Israeli society in general has been shifting further and further to the right. And that a lot of uh, political views vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians or even issues of democracy and the rule of law that were once you know, much more debatable about maybe even a decade, two, three decades ago, uh, is, has radically changed uh, in this time. Um, and so in, in many ways, it's kind of going the opposite of the U.S. direction where that conversation is, is arguably improving. But here, uh, from, especially from a Palestinian perspective, that conversation is actually worsening. 
those positions are worsening. Um, I'm curious how both of you have been seeing, um, you know, both whether and the kind of like the public, the Israeli public level, or even the Israeli political level, particularly, for example, the fact that Benny Gantz, who was uh, posed as this rival to Netanyahu, and in fact, very much aligned with his perspective on annexation, for example, of the Jordan Valley. Um, and that uh, for him, even his dispute with Netanyahu about annexation is less about um, whether or not it will actually happen, but how it's going to go about. Uh, Gantz keeps talking about the idea of coordinating with the international community um, and uh, getting more, um, being more prepared before you create that move. Um, so, it, so it's a bit of a broad question, kind of combining a few things that were raised by our guest, by uh, our audience. Um, but I'm see, uh, but how, how are you seeing Israeli politics and society moving forward with annexation? How are they interpreting, uh, you know, th these policy moves and and this process? Um, is it some? Are there areas of hope? Are we seeing that, in fact, it will continue to uh, to go down a rather dangerous trend? Emily, you can go ahead if you. I was deliberately waiting because there was a very large uh, large. Uh, motorcade of motorcycles outside my window, but uh, it seems to have dissipated. Um, great. I, I, um, I think, I mean, I think what's been, what's been very interesting to see is that despite uh, how kind of brazen um, the, you know, the leaders um, in Israel have been with regard to, to annexation, the public is, is divided. Um, most of the polls consistently over the past um, few months and, and weeks um, show at about 50% support and 50% uh, opposed. And um, I actually think that those numbers are, are even a bit deceiving because I don't think that the 50% that support actually all know what they are supporting. Um, there hasn't really been a clear picture of not only what parts uh, of the West Bank would be would be annexed, but um, but what it would look like, what it would mean for Israel, what the potential backlash could be, um, and and um, even what what daily life would look like um, for Palestinians as well. There's been just a lack of that um, discussion at all. Um, you know, it's as if the pros and cons are about are only about pros and cons for Israel, um, and. And yet, you know, when you break down the supporters um, into uh, what they would, would propose to do um, with the, the Palestinian um, residents that would remain in the, those annexed areas, it, they split into an entire range of options, um, including, I have no idea, um, but, but also, you know, running the gamut from um, give them full citizenship to um, give them nothing and potentially transfer um, or deport them out of out of that area, um, and I just I think that that while a lot of this is is you know is shocking to to anyone who um, is looking for for human rights and equality, um, I think it really mostly speaks to the fact that that like I said, there's a, a lot of ignorance, a lot of you know kind of gray, um, and and so um, in a way, I would also just say that now again. We have an opportunity um, to try and do some really important uh, basic education, um, and and I, you know, I don't I don't think that the um, the full solution will come only from um, from within Israel, but certainly um, Israel holds the key, and uh, in in more ways than one, um, and it is important um, to to you know not forget the. Um, the power or the influence um, of, of Israeli civil society and and of the public um, and the first step is is having the information at their fingertips I, w I wanted to add Amjad if I may for just a couple of seconds um, I've been spending a lot of time in the Jordan Valley and uh, I'm going to give you a flavor of some of the signs that I've seen in the Jordan Valley um, one is one that's in the Jordan Valley, but it's also in Jerusalem, a huge uh, sign with a picture of, of Netanyahu and a picture of Trump. And underneath it says um, uh, uh, sovereignty, because they don't use the term annexation, they talk about sovereignty. Um, and then in English it says, do it right. 
with that double entendre of do it the way the right wing wants it done and do it correctly. Um, and so this has been, this is one that you see all throughout the West Bank, Bay, in particular in the Jordan Valley. And the second sign that I've been seeing a lot in the Jordan Valley is, um, is a sign that reads, um, there will never be a Palestinian state accepted. So, and, and by the way, that one is written both in Hebrew and in English. Um, so it, again, the, the, the fact that these are going up is, is, is telling us something. I think that when, we, that when looking at Israeli society, not civil society, but looking at the Israeli population, look, you've got people like with the likes of Livni, who's a war criminal, like you can't even, there's no way of even making her out to be nice. Um, who's coming out and saying that she opposes annexation as well. Now, why does she oppose it? For the same reason that she opposed the, the nation state law, the Jewish nation state law, not because you know, she, she's somehow a lover of Palestinian rights, it's because it's violating the way that I was talking about at the beginning, which is do whatever it is that you want, but just do it under the radar and don't get the ire of the international community. So there is a, there is a good segment of people who are, um, who in addition to not knowing, there is that segment of people who are opposed because they, they feel that it's harming the, the image of Israel. And this is why you've seen some of these letters that are appearing in the United States of some of the, 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 the Jewish groups that are in the United States who are coming out very clearly. And they're not saying, or people like Daniel Pipes, they're not saying don't do annexation because it's illegal or it's immoral or it, or it harms Palestinians. It's going to lead to more settler violence, more settlements, etc. Their basic argument is this harms Israel. It harms Israel's image. And so let's not go down that path. And, um, and so, we, yes, we have seen a shift, very much seen a shift to the right. And in that shift to the right, that shift to the right is not swinging back with annexation. It's a, it's a shift to the right and, and with people, including Gantz, who support annexation, who are saying maybe now is not the right time uh, because there's too many eyes that are on us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that imagery as well for the Jordan Valley. Like it's a very physical uh, manifestation of that. Um, I'm very conscious of time and there are literally dozens of questions, but I'm afraid I think I think we're gonna have to close up for now. We've covered a very wide range of topics. Um, I want to give enormous, enormous thanks uh, to both uh, Diana and Emily for their insights, for keeping track of all the news today, as well as, you know, evaluating uh, uh, the entire issue of annexation for all these years, for the incredible work that they do. Uh, we highly recommend that you keep following them, whether they're giving uh, comments or writing pieces or the uh, legal work uh, that Emily is doing. Uh, we are, urge you to keep track of, of all those things. Um, of course, you know, this is not the end of the conversation. This is sort of like, think of it as a little roundup for all of us, you know, based on this rather dramatic day uh, or non-dramatic day, as it turned out. Um, and to really take the, you know, uh, pay heed to the takeaways that we've mentioned here, uh, that in the end, you know, that, you know, the process of annexation, it, it's a process, it's not an event. Uh, there's not, it's not really a tipping point, but this is something that will stay with us for a very long time, that will be much more complex, that it's not just about a single measure, and we should continue to monitor that. Um, and of course, you know, for all these sort of new, these reports and analyses as we keep moving forward in the coming days, weeks, months, and years ahead, uh, we of course always invite you to come on to 972 Magazine. We're publishing pieces every single day, keeping track of what's going on on the ground, uh, trying to center the communities uh, that are most affected by this, providing analyses from people like Diana and Emily, who we of course also hope to uh, bring back on to 972 uh, in, in all different ways. Um, and really, we thank you, uh, the audience, again, for joining us, for your support, and uh, wishing you all the best, and um, hope you're also staying safe still during this uh, ongoing time of pandemic, uh, and hope, uh, to, I hope to see us uh, all working together in the activism in the future. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Amjad. Appreciate it. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Amjad 972 and Diana, everyone who was here tonight. Thank you both. All Thank the best. You.